Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Elaine Cub recaps the USDA's November crop report. Al Dutcher explains why so much of the U.S. is experiencing below normal temperatures. Tom Hunt describes the use of neonicotinoid seed treatments in soybeans. And Bruce Anderson talks about the dangers of black nightshade when grazing corn stalks and soybean stubble. Elaine Cobb is our marketing analyst this week. The USDA Monday made slight changes to the sizes of this year's corn and soybean crops. The agency trimmed its corn projection by about 68 million bushels and increased its estimate on soybeans by about 31 and a half million bushels. Nebraska's share remained the same in corn but grew in soybeans as the USDA increased yield from 53 to 54 bushels per acre. As a whole, the U.S. soybean production estimate of 107.7 million metric tons surpasses Brazil's at 94 million metric tons and nearly doubles Argentina's 55 million metric ton estimate. We started our discussion with Elaine Thursday afternoon by asking for her thoughts on Monday's reports. Well, you know, the November crop reports are generally not very exciting, and this one shouldn't have been, and, and the markets didn't really seem to find it that exciting, but there was one weird little tweak. They dropped the U.S. average corn yield from, like, 174.2 mm -hmm. to 173.4. Like, it was a very small drop, but it seemed strange because everywhere across the United States we've heard very good yields. There's been nobody who's had disappointing yeah. yields. So... I looked at that and I think maybe it's related to um, the way that the corn is being stored or the way it's being harvested here at the end. You've got Wisconsin and Michigan that are very late with harvest and getting snowed on. And all across the northern Corn Belt we're seeing lots of open corn piles just because our pace of building storage has not kept up with the pace of yield gains. So I think perhaps there's some justification just if you think ahead to how much grain little bits and pieces might be lost because of the storage problems. Mm -hmm. They're cutting out the quality, is your opinion? I think, yes, and I think it's very hard to put a number on that because we don't know how wet it's coming into all of the elevators, and we don't know how big the piles are necessarily. Nobody has a very good handle on that, but it does bear some justification to a tweak in the, in the yield or in the overall production. Tell me how basis is moving here as we close out harvest. Pretty much just like you'd expect it to be. We finally have a normal year again where you have the, the gut slot of harvest with fairly normal basis numbers, 30 under, 40 under, and they're starting to tighten up here as the harvest comes to an end. Soybeans have been very, very volatile yeah. recently. How much of that is tagged to soybean meal? I think almost entirely. I mean, there's no other very bullish story you can come up with other than the fact that all of a sudden soybean meal is above $400 a ton. So on, on Thursday here, it had a fresh new high. It went even above its October high. And that's sort of a, a consistent pattern if you get, you know, a really short supply of some commodity and people are really struggling to source that and, and have built in this excited bubble. And I think the, to the degree that soybeans are following soybean meal, it may be an artificial bubble. There's a lot of speculative volume that's participating in that, and I don't know that it makes sense when you have almost 4 billion bushels of soybeans actually sitting in the world, so this soybean meal thing is, is a shorter term. If that's the case, and it is a bubble, if it would pop, what would that do? Well, I think it's... Does I, it follow, I guess, is my question. Yeah. I mean, at some point, the soybean meal supply chain will be filled up, 
these four billion bushels of soybeans will be turned into soybean meal and soybean oil, and, and, the, and the problem will, will solve itself. And at that point, the bubble will be justified to fall. But I think the soybean prices themselves could fall even sooner than that, simply they're overpriced compared to corn. Like I said, there's a bunch of them, yeah. and it doesn't necessarily need to follow soybean meal the way that it has. So December 15, corn is ahead of 14. November 15, soybeans are lower than 14. Analyze those ratios. Yeah, again, it's the very immediate uh, demand for soybeans that is, is causing the biggest premiums. But even in 2015, we still have soybeans that are overpriced compared to corn as far as their historical ratio goes. So at this point, you'd look ahead to 2015 and still see soybeans being the more profitable way to go. But I don't know if that's going to last all through winter and spring. Eventually, these relationships come back together. Do you feel then that there are still acres in play and farmers deciding whether or not to go to corn or soybeans next spring? Absolutely, and I think that it makes sense to kind of sit and wait because uh, one place where the acres are very actively in play is they're being planted right now in Brazil and Argentina. And the estimates there are that they're going to plant more than expected soybeans because it's more profitable there, obviously. Uh, they may not plant very many acres of corn at all, so we could easily see you know, a spring rally for corn that would bring that profitability a little more favorable. And if the fertilizer stays kind of cheap or, or relatively affordable as it has, you know, I, I think that corn could very well be a player in 2015. What are your targets here for, let's say, cash selling of either corn or soybeans? Well, like I said, the soybeans are overpriced. They've had this incredible run up for, you know, questionable justification. So I think if you could get a $10 on soybeans or if you don't even want to risk it to, you know, be too aggressive there, that soybeans might be presenting you an opportunity. But again, this is a fairly normal year. You might expect to see a fairly normal seasonal pattern of corn going up through the spring, maybe March, April timeframe. We could easily see a $4 in front of it, I think. Uh, Brent crude oil is now hovering below or right at $80 a barrel. Is there significance to that or does it surprise you? It's significant um, in that it is directly related to the strength of the U.S. dollar and the way that the entire commodity sector really gets pummeled when the dollar is as strong as it is. So grains follow that to some extent. Cheaper consumer goods make the stock market go up. So it's just part of a bigger pattern. Yeah. Next week, Luke Beckman from Central Valley Ag will join us to analyze corn and soybean markets. Nebraska, along with many other states, is experiencing a stretch of well below normal temperatures this week. Snow fell across the state Monday night into Tuesday, with more in the forecast for much of the state this weekend. UNL Extension State climatologist Al Dutcher sat down with us Thursday to explain why so much of the U.S. is under the cold snap and to give his outlook for the winter season. We've had some uh, fun temperatures in this state and many other states across the United States this week. Why? Well, in simple terms, we basically had a repeat performance of what we experienced for the vast majority of last winter. That is uh, the old term polar vortex. And really what happens is, is we have a blocking high pressure that sits up over the western United States, extends up into Alaska. All the energy from storms entering into the Gulf of Alaska are deflected up over top of that ridge. And then, of course, that energy comes down the front side of the ridge, basically bringing that polar area in from the Arctic circles and intensifies the trough in the eastern United States. And on the front of that trough, you have a blocking high pressure ridge east of Greenland. So everything kind of stagnates. And so in order for that to break down, you either have to have that trough in the east of us weaken or you have to have that ridge break down in Canada in western western portion mm -hmm. of Canada in Alaska and that's exactly what the models are forecasting as we move forward in time that we'll start to see an erosion of that blocking ridge and we'll start to see more energy coming into the Pacific Northwest instead of being deflected up into into Alaska and Canada and therefore once that happens you're going to get troughing action in the western United States building a ridge into the center part of the country and hence we start to warm up with a trough to the west of us. All right, we warm up then. Then how long does that continue? As in uh, across the winter, what are you expecting to see for temperature? Well, if I could get that forecast right, I'd be pretty much a rich man. And, and I think that's the overall writing question of, of what's going to happen. You know, from from a standpoint, that we're we're dealing with a very weak El Nino event. We have seen signs of that in regards to tropical systems coming up the Baja Peninsula during the late summer, early fall period, getting deflected up into the southwestern United States and then getting entrained into frontal boundaries moving across the northern tier of states. So Husker Harvest Days was an example where we had one of those tropical systems entrained in the front. We had widespread heavy precipitation and some localized flooding. Most recently we've seen that same event occur with Hurricane Vance that did the same thing down in Texas and Oklahoma where we had a, a two-day spell of 
basically moderate rain that fell continuously really did put a damper in some of the drought areas. So as we go forward, that area becomes less of a problem because we're, in, we're coming to the end of hurricane season. But what we're watching for is whether or not there's still enough warm water there to support these troughs coming to the western United States and energize them if they move into the desert southwest. And so you'll get these southern stream storms that basically bypass Nebraska to our south. That would be your El Nino signal. The other thing we're dealing with is this polar vortex, which is your La Nina-like signal because generally during La Nina events, we have a very strong polar jet. So what we've seen this entire year is this flopping back and forth between these polar outbreaks and then very warm conditions. And I just don't see any reason to see that break up right now. There's this high pressure system doesn't appear to be locking into place. So I think what we're going to deal with is these defined periods of very cold, stormy weather followed by an intense warm spell as a new trough moves mm -hmm. into the western United States, only to be followed by another wetter storm coming into the south of us and then moving up into the northeastern United States and drawing that cold air in. So this oscillation back and forth, I believe, is going to be the thing we're going to deal with. As we get to the second half of the winter, things get a lot more difficult because El Nino becomes less of a player. And then we have to worry mm -hmm. about those late spring storms with a very energized northern jet moving through. And of course, that's when we get the big wind up of our blizzards and big snowstorms during the late winter. Does that indicate then that you expect it to be a wet winter? I wouldn't go that far. I've always been leery about making a precipitation forecast in the winter because some people will take snowfall as, your, as a measurement of your precipitation. And I look at the water equivalency of that moisture as the most important criteria, and that's more difficult. Snow-wise, I think we'll be well ahead of last year's snow season. There wasn't much of one here anyhow. The big question is, do these come in terms of Arctic fronts moving through where we get our snowfall, or do we get southern storms? And right now, I'd be leaning to a combination of both, which should increase us back up to at least normal snowfall, if not slightly above normal snow. Beginning of the water year is October 1st, correct? Where do we stand? Well, we haven't had a lot of precipitation since October 1st, but we had a lot of it from late September late August through September. And so we have the southeast and the Panhandle in very good shape. In fact, we got profiles in some portions of the southeast and the Panhandle that are very close to full. The center part of the state has had a recent drying trend during the, and it promoted good harvest activity. What we need to see is a ground thaw out a little bit, get one good storm on top of it to wet that surface layer back up, and we should be in fine shape till the spring. So overall, we're in much better shape than we have been the last three years, but I'm, all, I'm greedy. I'd like to see another event before we f solidly freeze that soil up so that we know that we're running into good moisture at the surface going into the spring thaw season. Al will return later in the show to forecast temperatures and precipitation chances for Nebraska over the next week. In addition to farming, Scott Holtgrew of Atkinson finds time to build center pivot systems, lots of them. He tells Nebraska Farmer in the November issue that he and his crew installed 155 pivots this past summer. Holtgrew started building things at an early age. When he was 17, he and a friend took apart an old water drive system and sold the metal for scrap. Despite the pivot building business, Holtgrew continues to farm his own ground and helps operate around 1,800 acres of corn and soybeans on his parents' farm. You can read more about Holtgrew in the November Nebraska Farmer. The Environmental Protection Agency recently released a report on the use of neonicotinoid seed treatments in soybeans and concluded they provide negligible overall benefits in most situations. The EPA's data review showed there was no difference in soybean yield when seed was treated or not treated with neonicotinoids. Earlier this week, we talked with UNL Extension entomologist Tom Hunt to discuss this report, what it could mean for future production, and the purpose of these types of seed treatments. Neonicotinoids are a, a class of insecticides that act similarly on the same receptor site, a neonicotine uh, nicotine receptor site within the insect. Mm -hmm. And so there's a class of these insecticides that can be applied on the seed prior to planting that uh, are systemic, so they're taken up by the plant, and so they have a toxic effect on insects for about, oh, three weeks or so on those seedling young uh, bean plants. And you use them for what purpose? Um, in Nebraska, the primary target are bean leaf beetles. Mm -hmm. um, in some areas of the country, they have some other insects like uh, uh, plant hoppers and cutworms and things, but in Nebraska, it's primarily bean leaf beetle. The EPA has released a study that uh, reviews their use. What did the EPA conclude? Well, the EPA did a study that was a very broad brush type study that looked at the benefits of neonicotinoid seed treatments as applied to control insects, and they found that there wasn't a benefit really to the farmer in a broad brush across 
the U.S. Now, you know and I know that agriculture is local, pest management is local, even to the field. So there are benefits to neonicotinoids on soybeans. It's just that they found that they were overused. And um, for the most part, I would agree to that, although I don't want to discount the, the times that they are useful. Why is this uh, review important? What could they do to their use in the future? Well, they weren't explicit why they uh, did the study, but I imagine it's because of the effect of neonicotinoids on bees and pollinators that we've been hearing of, and the fact that they're so broadly used. They're used on almost all corn acres, and across the U.S., about 30% of the bean acres, but local areas up to 80%. So that's what drove this study, I believe, and, you know, we don't know what the... Ref uh, effects or what the ramifications of it are, but it could be restricted use or could be regulation of these products on some crops. Specifically for Nebraska, you've touched on this, but how widespread is their use and what are they using them for? Um, neonicotinoid seed treatments are used for either soil insects early in the season or early season pests of a variety of plants. They're on uh, they're placed on corn, they're placed on soybeans, and a variety of other plants on the seeds. And so typically it's insects, typically early in the year if we're talking seed treatments. In Nebraska, do you feel there are situations where neonicotinoid seed treatments in soybeans are overused? Um, yes, I believe they are. Um, most of the bean leaf beetle that we see are on the early planted fields, the fields that are the isolated field that comes up very early and there's no other fields around. The bean leaf beetles can uh, roll into those fields and cause significant damage. Also, in some areas uh, along the river, uh, Missouri River and some river valleys, there have been in the past some bean pod model virus that are vectored by bean leaf beetles, and this can be useful in managing that particular uh, disease. It's not widespread in Nebraska, mm -hmm. but it is there, and it is a problem in some other states, particularly to the east. And then there are some cases where if it's very hilly ground and it's hard to get in there, um, you know, uh, it's, and you do have bean leaf yeah. beetles, it's an advantage to have a seed treatment. So how would you recommend that farmers in Nebraska use either these seed treatments or something else? Um, first of all, kind of look at the field history, and if you're in an area that regularly has high bean leaf beetle populations, has had uh, economically damaging bean pod model virus, and you plant early, that's a case where you would benefit from a seed treatment like neonicotinoid seed treatments. Um, typically, the first fields you plant, um, particularly if they're in May or, I mean, April or the first week of May, that may benefit. If it's past the first week of May, particularly middle May or beyond, I don't see a benefit to the seed treatments. They are not effective against really soybean aphid, um, particularly in Nebraska. They can kind of uh, slow the growth down a little bit, but you still, if you're going to have soybean aphids, they come in July typically where they build up, and that's well past when neonicotinoids are active. Are there dangers in using them season after season after season? Yes, and I think that's one of the main things I worry about is resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, we see resistance to any product that's used on a wide basis repeatedly over time. We saw that with some of the BT toxins for rootworms. We've seen it with a lot of other OPs and a lot of other insecticides. So this is a very nice chemistry. It works very well, and so I'd like to keep it around, and I'd like to keep it around for the instances we need it on soybeans and other crops. So uh, resistance to insecticides is, is one of the primary reasons that I'd like to see the uh, more targeted use of neonicotinoid seed treatments. This issue is currently open for public comment. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to a CropWatch article on the EPA's report and information about how to submit a comment. Nebraska's farmers had harvested 79% of their corn and 98% of their soybeans as of the latest USDA progress report. We've told you before how cattle grazing on that open land can actually benefit soybean production the following year. However, UNL Extension Forage Specialist Bruce Anderson says black nightshade is present in a number of fields and carries a risk to animals that might consume it. We talked with Bruce Monday about why producers need to keep an eye on the plant as livestock are turned out into those lands. Black nightshade is a, is a weed that we tend to see often occurring in many of our soybean and sometimes in our cornfields, especially uh, if the canopy has been damaged. And this year we've had an awful lot of hail in many places, so it lets light get in there and the black nightshade starts to thrive and we get quite a bit out there. And there's some concern that it's maybe common in fields this year? It is very common in many fields and very dense and a lot of people are concerned about uh, that density. Okay, why is it toxic to livestock? Well, it's got toxins 
toxins and different poisons, solanine in them that uh, uh, is present in the leaves, in the stems, also in the green berries. As the berries start turning ripe, uh, it starts to lose it in the berries, but the foliage still stays poisonous. So when cattle owners put their livestock out on corn stalks or bean stubble for grazing this time of the year, uh, we have some concerns that the animals might be attracted to the nightshade, start consuming uh, enough of that to end up having poisoning problems. Could it also affect horses if you have horses mixed in there or uh, it, other it, livestock it, as well? It has uh, effects on horses, on sheep, on most of the type of livestock that we could have in this area. Does it appear that the cattle uh, selectively graze this plant at all, or do they favor one part of the plant uh, rather than the other? Well, that's one of the things that I think we're fortunate with, is that the animals don't seem to find the black nightshade very palatable. Uh, we've had black nightshade in pastures and in uh, uh, residue fields for many years, and people have grazed it without too many problems. But some of the concern maybe this year is that it's so widespread, that as a result, uh, there's gonna be a lot more animals that will have the potential to select from it. Also with the recent cold temperatures, uh, the plant may have changed its composition enough to make it more attractive to the animals. So we just have a little uncertainty as to what's gonna be happening out in those fields. Describe the toxicity levels that you would be uncomfortable with that you think really could cause problems. Well, old data, and, and when I say old data, we're mm -hmm. talking about information that's as much as 50 years old, suggests that uh, a thousand pound cow should not consume more than one to three pounds of black nightshade. Uh, but because we haven't seen problems in the past, I think that's a pretty conservative number. And because we've had uh, uh, many times situations where the potential for toxicity existed and we didn't see very much problems, that most producers will be able to get by fine, but we're gonna have to keep our eyes open and, and watch for any kind of problems, I think. The hard freeze that uh, swept across Nebraska this week, at least most of Nebraska this week, uh, does that change whether or not the plant is still able to produce the toxin? Well, it's probably not growing anymore, but the toxins that are in the plant are gonna be very stable. So the plant still is gonna have it toxicity potential out there. And what I suggest producers do is that primarily, if you're going to graze the field, uh, put maybe just a few animals out to begin with to see if they graze on the black nightshade. If they don't, put the rest of the herd out there. But always be observant, watch for any changes. And if they do start to graze on the black nightshade, preferentially especially, then maybe it would be wise to move them off that field and, and go somewhere else where the nightshade won't be a problem. Again, Bruce says drying as hay or after a freeze will not reduce the toxicity of black nightshade. He says for animals that may have consumed black nightshade, visual signs don't provide clear diagnosis of poisoning. But animals that are acting lethargic or weak or appear to be breathing heavily or salivating could suggest a potential problem. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. What can we say? Just brutally cold temperatures invaded the, the state, in fact almost the entire eastern two-thirds of the United States during this last week. The model output that I was using in terms of temperature forecast, I just didn't believe we could get as cold as we were, so I got my head handed to me on a platter, so to speak, and in the, as simple as terms you can say, uh, thought that the surface temperatures would certainly offset some of this cold air. So the temperatures actually come in about 10 degrees colder than what the for, more forecast models were for this week. We'll try to get a little better as we come up through this next week, and certainly today looks to be the most active day in this entire forecast as we have yet another impulse coming through with a reinforcing shot of cold air and unfortunately snowfall. But after we see the departure of this system, we start to see a slight moderation trend during the week with even a better chance as we go into next weekend for a return to normal temperatures in our region uh, unless we start to see a complete one 180 degree reversal from the model. So let's take a look at what we see in the upper air pattern. And here, once again, we have this broad based trough that extends well up into Canada as we got a blocking high pressure system east of Alaska that's allowing this Arctic air to funnel down into the northern Rockies and all points to the east. So this next piece of energy is going to wrap around. We have this frontal boundary moving through the state right now. Another piece of energy will wrap down through the southern plains and this will merge into a reinforcing trough in the eastern United States and start to allow some of this ridging in the western United States to build our way. So the quantitative precipitation forecast for day is indicating between a tenth and a quarter inch of moisture across the eastern two-thirds of the state. That would translate into a general coverage of about one and a half to four inches 
of snowfall. The heaviest totals right now appear to be across north central Nebraska and another secondary area between a quarter and a half inch laying across north central and northeast Kansas. If this area here does shift a little bit toward the north, we will be looking at much of southeast Nebraska and possibly having two to upwards of five inches of snowfall. For right now, we're keeping the heaviest precipitation to our south. As we go to tomorrow, you can start to see that this entire system starts pivoting. We still keep that cold air flowing straight over the eastern half of the state. So we're going to get reinforcing cold cold air for at least Sunday and some of this may hold into Monday. We may have some flurry activity to deal with, but it doesn't look like any pressing significant accumulations. Now as we go into Tuesday, you'll start to see that this trough begins to broaden out and weaken and this ridge starts to build back in. So our temperatures are going to start to moderate somewhat during the middle of the week. We get it closer up toward the freezing march across a good portion of eastern Nebraska. And then another system through the southern stream starts to make its way eastward. We'll be watching this one right now. It keeps it south of the state, but any northward turn and we could be looking at uh, reinforcing forcing shot of snowfall across the eastern part of the state. We see that system moves rapidly across Texas and we see a little bit of residual cold air moving in to cool us down slightly before we start to see warmer temperatures building in as this ridge moves into our region. So if we look at the forecast in terms of temperatures, very cold conditions with snow this weekend, slight moderation through the middle of the week with a slight cool down as we get toward the end of next week. Eight to 14 day forecast shows that this cold air is starting to weaken with this warm air moving in and in terms of precipitation, nothing to speak of. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews can be found on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on the November crop report, an outlook on precipitation and temperatures during winter, neonicotinoid seed treatments in soybeans, and the dangers of black nightshade when grazing corn stalks and soybean stubble. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Next week, Luke Beckman will be our marketing analyst, and we'll look at the link between soybean cyst nematode and aphids. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board, the Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.